Isn't that nice? <laughs> so let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very pleased to come together. We're very pleased to know that you have proclaimed and obtained victory over all the powers of darkness. We welcome this news each day in our lives to know that we are on the victory side and we're here today to celebrate your death and resurrection, your reigning in glory over this wicked world. We praise you and thank you. May we hear from you this morning and may that all that we do bring you honour and glory. For Christ's sake, amen. Now Jill's coming up. <clears throat> This is just a little um, welcome poem that I wrote, scribbled yesterday. We welcome you to ACC, a church where we are family. We smile at friends and find a seat, then look around and hope to greet somebody new who's come today to join us as we praise and pray. Our church is not just what you see a building where we love to be. The church is people, you and me, worshipping God who set us free, free from what we were before Jesus knocked on our heart's door. We opened it and he came in, forgiving us for all our sin. New life is ours with hope and peace, with joy that daily will increase as we read his word his truth to know, together we will closer grow. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Now, our first hymn is coming up on screen. May the mind of Christ. the mind of Christ. Good morning. It's a word I live by, which is Psalm 100, which is subtitled, For Giving Grateful Praise. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. 
We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for God is good and his love endures forever. His, faith, his faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Amen. Now we've got, we've got two wonderful rousing songs. The first one, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. Shall see him. 
So spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of Lord still line the way, returning triumphs of His grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Please sit down. Thank you again for each of you who's come today. We're privileged. We've got Chris, who's prepared a message on the kingdom of God in our minds. So let's listen attentively. And we'll just pray again for Chris. Lord, we're so grateful to give Chris good thoughts, a good heart. Please bless his every word for your glory. Amen. Amen. Just didn't hear that. <laughs> you did, yes. Uh, kids, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all, and um, thank you very much for having me to speak. Um, yes, yeah, so Pastor Peter's away uh, on holiday still, so uh, it falls to me to uh, speak this morning. Um, hopefully, you remember we started a series um, a few uh, a month or so ago on the kingdom of God uh, in our lives. Um, people who were here for that, uh, people who vaguely remember it, give me a hand up. You know, don't worry, not nobody's counting. That's great. Okay, so some of you, some of you are here for that, um, and we're going to continue that series today, and it's on the kingdom of God in our minds. If you remember when we started the series, uh, we talked about is Jesus king over, or how much is Jesus king? over? Is he just king over part of my life? Just the part where I come along on a Sunday and then maybe a little bit during the week when I meet in my home, home group or something like that. Um, is he just king of the part of my life that I might call religious? Or is Jesus actually the king of all of our lives? The whole of our life and not just our lives but the lives of those around about us. Actually Jesus, the Bible says, is king over the whole world. The king, he is the ultimate ruler over everything. And so the question is, though, how does that work out uh, in our lives? Are we actually living as if Jesus is the king of our lives? And uh, you might remember that um, we talked uh, as part of that about uh, the verse, you were once darkness, but you are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That was from Ephesians. Uh, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And you probably remember there were two pictures that I put up at that point. Uh, I asked the question, are, you, are we sunbathers? Uh, which could mean uh, bathing in the sun in the light of God, or could even be bathing in the sun of God, if you'll allow me to make a quick pun there. Or are we like, more like a vampire? We hate the light and we want to stay away from it. Now, one of the things that we saw, uh, touched on last time, was that within us, there is actually a constant spiritual battle. We often think about, well, those who are Christians and those who are not, and maybe we think, well, all Christians are sunbathers and everyone who's not a Christian is a vampire. Hopefully you don't think that. But uh, we, we could think in those terms, in terms of the darkness and the light, people who love God and people who oppose God. But actually, it's much more personal than that, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever been, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you'll know uh, you should be able to acknowledge that there is a spiritual battle, not just in the world, but inside us. Um, what we referred to last time as the flesh, or the, the old sinful nature that we have, the part of us that wants to disobey God um, and not do what God wants, which is more like the vampire, keep me away from the light, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who comes into us when we put our faith in Jesus, um, who, want, who wants to bask in the light. And we have this question, well, am I basking in the sun or am I hating the light? Which is winning in my life at the moment? God has given us all the resources we need to live a life of victory in the Holy Spirit. But we have to walk in the Spirit. It's no use just assuming it's going to happen automatically. And uh, we saw this verse here. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. And this is not just our battle outside, but our inward battle. It's not against flesh and blood. 
It's not against other human beings, but against rulers, against authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God. He's, he's describing something that should sound quite scary. We should look at this and think there's a battle going on and it's not, it's not like the battles of the Old Testament where God's enemies were these groups of people and God's people were this group of people and they had a physical battle. That, that era is over. We no, longer have, we no longer fight as Christians against non-Christians in that way. This is one of the verses that tells you we shouldn't be using a war to try and uh, spread Christianity anymore. Um, but instead, now the battle is in a higher plane. It's against rulers, it's against authorities, it's against world powers of darkness. He's talking about spiritual forces of evil. He's talking about the devil and his angels who are arrayed against us in our minds, not on a battlefield that we can see, but in our minds. And that should should terrify us in one way. Uh, That should make us a bit frightened because we should think, well, I'm vulnerable, I need help in this. But what has God given us? He says, this is why you must... You must take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. And so this verse tells us that we are all in a spiritual war. Whether we like it or not, there's no choice, there's no option as to whether to fight in this war. We have four options that we can choose from. We can either retreat and just abandon, abandon to, you know, just retreat. We can surrender and say, yes, you can have your way in my life. You can allow Satan to have his way. We can appease or compromise. We can try and find accommodation with the devil and try and find some areas where we're doing the right thing and some areas where we're doing the wrong thing. Or we can defend and attack. We can launch a counterattack and actually seek to win the victory uh, in our lives in a spiritual battle for our, mi- our minds. So we're in a spiritual battle, there's nothing we can do about it, and we need to be on the counterattack. So, I don't know if you, anyone, who's heard of Sun Tzu? Sun Tzu, oh dear, okay. Right. Oh, a few people there, great, thank you, good. Um, could anyone tell me anything about him at all? He is, thank you very much. He is a, a, an ancient, a very old book, um, and a legendary Chinese strategist and philosopher, and his most famous work is called The Art of War. And it's still referred to today uh, by strategists. It's considered one of the uh, primary books on warfare. This is what uh, Sun Tzu has to say. If you know your enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a 100 battles. Know your enemy and know yourself, You need not fear the results of a hundred battles. That's very good advice for warfare. If you don't understand where your enemy is at, what their strength is, uh, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, you have no hope of winning the battle. Now, if that's true of physical battles in this world, it's also true of spiritual battles. If we want to win this war in our minds, we need to know who our enemies are. And Christians have traditionally identified three uh, enemies of the soul. Um, and you've probably heard this phrase before. First of all, the world around about us. The people around about us, the world system around about us that seeks to crush Christianity, that that opposes God, that seeks to live its life without reference to God and in an atheistic or or different religions and things like that. The world around about us is seeking to crush us and squeeze us into its mold, the Bible says, uh, or to just oppose us if we seek to stand. And it is trying to tell us to believe what everyone else believes rather than what God says is true. So the world around about us. Secondly, the thing we referred to a minute ago, the flesh. It's not just a war outside. We have an enemy within. We have our old nature from before we were Christians, uh, which still hangs around until we uh, go to be with Jesus and causes us to struggle, struggles with sin um, and struggles and tempts us inside. We, We get tempted by our old nature not to live in God's way and not to think God's way. And finally, sorry about that picture, I couldn't find a better one that I actually wanted to put on the screen. Um, finally, the devil, the, the fallen angel who has opposed God since the beginning of time, who wants to basically created all of the things that are wrong in this world by turning away from God's plan. And the devil wants to draw us in. He, but Jesus said, this, the devil seeks to kill and to destroy, but I have come that you may have, have life. So we have the world all around about us, These are the enemies of our minds, the flesh deep within us and the devil high above us. We have some formidable enemies. But here is the promise. Oh, I will know if the verse doesn't come up. The verse will come up at the end. The promise that we have 
the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.16 is that we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And that is more powerful for the battle of our minds than any of these things. And um, there are many ways in which the mind of Christ can control our lives. There are many different aspects, but I've chosen just three, which I think correspond well with those three enemies that we have. Uh, And they are the word of Christ, or the Bible, the things that Jesus taught, the rest of the Bible, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, The Holy Spirit himself, uh, who fights against our flesh, and the Bible talks often about the spirit and the flesh fighting with one another, but we have victory in the spirit. Um, Oh, I should have said... The word, obviously, the devil, how do we resist the devil? Well, we use the example of Jesus. When he was tempted, he used the word of God to resist the devil. Uh, And finally, in 1 John, it says that this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so we have uh, the mind of Christ. These are, we have three powerful enemies, but we have at least three, and more we'll come on to in a minute, powerful allies who are there to help us to have the victory uh, in our minds, to establish God's kingdom and to, uh, to keep it in our minds. So what do we need to do? What does the Bible say we need to do? What's our part to play if we want to bring these allies uh, into the battle on our side? What does God doesn't just come in and just give us the victory. He expects us to do something as well. There's a couple of verses that we're going to look at here. First one is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. This is what Peter says. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So do you see there are three commands in there? First of all, be ready for action. Secondly, be serious. And thirdly, be holy. There are other commands in there as well, but um, those are the ones that I want to focus on this morning. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. Do look up these verses um, so that you have them in front of you, particularly this one, uh, if you want to use a church Bible. This is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. This will be the main passage for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3 and 5. Uh, It's on page 1164, if if you'd like to read it there. Let's give you a moment if you want to look that up. I'll just start reading it now. Though we live in a body, we do not wage war in an unspiritual way, since the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. You see how it's the same teaching as in Ephesians. We're not fighting a physical war. Uh, Even though we live in a body, we're not fighting with our bodies. Instead, we're not using worldly weapons. Instead, we're using spiritual weapons, spiritual weapons that are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. This is what we're to do. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to to obey Christ. So if there's one verse that you take away and that you think about from this uh, talk today, then I would love it to be this one. It's about the fact that, again, the the fight we're fighting is not a battle where we have to go out and literally hurt people or, or defend ourselves physically. That's not the way that Jesus taught us. Instead now, that warfare is now spiritual. And that means it's in the mind. First and foremost, it's in the mind. And we're to take those arguments, those misleading arguments, the things that the world and the flesh and the devil try to trick us with and say, well, what about this? Well, how about that? Well, this is surely true, and that's against what God says in the Bible. We take those arguments and we demolish those. And instead, we take every thought captive. That's quite, it's quite a, a task, isn't it? I don't know how much you watch your mind, and it's very easy. My mind wanders all over the place. The Bible says we are, by the power of the Spirit, to take every thought captive. Every thought that we have, it's not that they won't be misleading and rebellious thoughts in our minds, but when we see one, we take it, we analyze it, we say, is this subject to Christ? Is this a thought that is obedient to Christ? If it is, then I'm going to treasure it and it's going to flourish in my mind. If it's not, I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to demolish it. I'm going to work out why it's wrong and it's going to be captive in my mind. I might be able to be able to kill it, but it's going to be captive and it's not going to roam free in my mind and in my life. So this is the challenge that we have. We need to take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we have some powerful enemies who are trying to throw us off beam. And they'll they'll use clever tactics and they'll use things which sound true. 
uh, in order to lead us astray uh, from God's truth. What might that look like uh, in real life? Um, I don't. Some of you are going to know exactly what this TV show is. Um, for those who don't, then uh, my apologies. I'll try and explain afterwards. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Right on schedule. Got my little happy helpers. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Whatever. What's the matter? Nothing. Okay. Everything. I think we're calling off the wedding. What? You're still going to pay me, right? <laughs> or something a little less selfish? Carol, what's the matter? What happened? My parents called this afternoon to say they weren't coming. Oh, my God. I mean, I knew they were having trouble with this whole thing, but... But they're my parents. I mean, they're supposed to give me away and everything. Okay, I'm sorry. And then Susan and I got in this big fight because I said maybe we should call off the wedding. And then she said, we're not doing this for them. We're doing it for us. And if I couldn't see that, then maybe we should call off the wedding. I don't know what to do. I uh, can't believe I'm going to say this, but I think Susan's Penny. right. Just set it up a bit. Just turn it up a bit. Look, do you it's love her? Fun. And you don't have to be too emphatic about this. <laughs> of course I do. Well, then that's it. And if George and Adelaide can't accept that, then the hell with them. Look, I mean, if my parents didn't want me to marry you, no way that would have stopped me. But, look, this is your wedding. Do it. You're right. Of course you're right. So we're back on? We're back on. You heard the woman? Peel, chop, devil! <laughs> Can't believe I lost two minutes. <laughs> You know, nothing makes God happier than when two people, any two people, come together in love. Okay. Um, how did that make you feel? Um, I wonder if it, if it, would you feel that it was trying to, uh, what do you think it was trying to do? Uh, you may or may not know that that was the first ever lesbian wedding shown on television. Uh, it was uh, quite revolutionary for its time. Uh, they deliberately didn't show the couple kissing because they thought it would cause too much offence back in the 90s. Um, so that was the limit, although they did have, still have some complaints. Um, nowadays, that would be par for the course. I don't think anyone would, would bat an eyelid if that was shown on television. Um, well, the interesting thing is, how is it designed to make you feel? There's an awful lot that is going on in that show, which is trying to change your mind about what you might have thought about same-sex marriage. Um, I'm not going to go into same-sex marriage today. Um, the fact that I've shown you that probably tells you what I believe the Bible teaches about it and that it's not, it's not what God wants. Uh, but nonetheless, that is an example of a TV show which is trying to change your mind very subtly, and Friends was incredibly influential in that way in trying to get people to accept a more liberal view of, uh, of sexuality. And probably, when you first watched that show, you, you may not even have registered actually what was happening because it's so... Um, so prevalent nowadays. And yet, let me, can I suggest to you that if we're watching a show like that, and I'm not coming out saying don't watch Friends, but, uh, Helen and I have watched the whole thing, we think some of it's really funny, so I'm not coming out saying that. But we have to be aware that it is trying to change your mind about things, it is trying to lead you in a direction, a certain way of thinking, and I want you to ask yourself the question, well, have I, do, am I letting ev every thought be taken captive by Christ? Or are my thoughts being taken captive by something else? What does it look like for us to be serious and to take every thought captive to obey Christ uh, in the world that we live in, which is constantly bombarding us with different messages and different understandings of what is moral, what is right and what is wrong? Um, were Carol's parents right to refuse to go to her wedding? Um, was the wedding a right thing to go through in the first place? 
Let me suggest to you that there are a number of things that we can do, and this is really the meat of the talk that we're going to have today, um, to take every thought captive uh, to obey Christ. Um, and I'm going to use the example of uh, Nehemiah. I, hopefully people are familiar with the book of Nehemiah. Um, he came and he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and he engaged in a, in a form of warfare. It was a kind of a cold war. There weren't that many battles and things like that. But nonetheless, there were many enemies who wanted to stop him from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, which had been torn down by their enemies uh, and from making, from reestablishing the defenses. And there's a lot we can learn uh, from the example of Nehemiah when we're thinking about taking our thoughts captive in that spiritual way. The first example, first thing that Nehemiah does uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, you don't need to look all these up, I'll read them out to you, is he studies uh, the terrain around about him. Uh, he says, I got up at the night and I took a few men with me. I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. He knew, needed to know his terrain and any military strategist will tell you, you need to understand your terrain in order to wage war well. What does that look like for us today? Well, we need to ask ourselves questions. We need to know what's going on in the world. What is going on in the world? How are people trying to change our minds? What are the main moral uh, shifts in our culture that are taking place? In what ways uh, are people trying to convince us that certain things are right and wrong? There are loads of causes. You have got the LGBT cause. You've got the cause of trying to save the environment. That's a very powerful cause today. You've got the cause for organic eating. You've got cause for people saying you shouldn't eat meat. Um, lots of things going on. You've got women's rights. You've got all sorts of things. Um, I'm not... Many of these things are good, and we need to get behind these, co these, these causes insofar as they're in line with God's word. But nonetheless, we need to understand. If we don't understand what's going on in the world around about us, we'll have no hope of understanding the ways in which we might be influenced in a wrong way um, away from God's word. In what way are we being directed by our culture? There's an interesting verse in 1 Chronicles 12.32 which says that there was a group of people within the land of Israel who were called the sons of Issachar. Have we heard of the sons of Issachar? The sons of Issachar and what they're told about them, it's in a big long list of groups. It says these were people who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. This is a gift that God gives to certain people, to certain individuals, to certain groups who are understanding, who are looking at these situations and understanding, trying to understand the world and world events in the light of God's world. And we need to identify and heed those people. Um, I used to work for an organization called Christian Concern. Uh, there are many other good organizations like the Christian Institute uh, and Care and others who are trying to take uh, the, attitude, the ideas of the world and say, well, which stuff is good? Which stuff can we get behind? Which stuff can we get behind with qualifications? Like some of it's good, but some of it's a bit off, so we just need to modify it a bit. And which stuff do we actually need to oppose? And we need to identify, we need to be switched on to these things. Don't just assume you can go through life taking, your, your, taking every thought captive if you don't understand the battlegrounds where you are. Our culture is steadily retreating in many ways, uh, and in some ways advancing, but in many ways retreating uh, from, from godliness and from what is right. Uh, and we need to understand what's going on. Uh, things like this Friends episode are key elements in that direction, and they happen very subtly and very quietly. You might not even realize. Uh, might, uh, if you watch Neighbours, for example, you'll see that they are trying to change your mind on a whole variety of issues, and you need to be aware of what is going on. Secondly, Enjoy a balanced diet. This is, what, um, this is what it says in Nehemiah. The, when the Israelites had settled, they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. Uh, and then they read from it. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, we're told Joshua is commanded to keep this book of the law. This was the first few books of the Bible. Always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And what's this got to do with diet? Well, one of the things that we can think about in terms of diets is a diet of the mind. What are we putting into our minds? Are we putting in the word of God, which the Bible describes as first milk for those who are young Christians, and then meat? It's nutritious. It's good. It helps us to understand what's right and wrong. It makes us strong spiritually. It makes us battle fit if we're eating and eating the word of God. Or... Are we spending the whole of our time eating what we might call fast food? Now, not everything in Friends is wrong. 
there's a lot of stuff in there that you can take about friendship and about how to support each other. And there's good stuff in there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we can't watch uh, non-Christian TV shows. Um, but if we are only doing that, if that's the primary intake, it's a bit like we're eating McDonald's the whole time and ignoring you know, the, the decent meal that we could be cooking for ourselves at home, uh, the meal that's actually based on God's word. So the questions we should ask ourselves, if the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, if we want to have the power of the Spirit to win the victory, we need the word of God. We need to ask ourselves, is friends the only thing that I watch? Do I only ever listen to what I read on social media from my non-Christian friends? Do I only ever listen to secular news? Is that the only way I understand what's happening in the world? Am I only watching secular books, music and films? Am I only spending time with my non-Christian friends? Because if we want to have a Christian culture in our mind, we need to feed well. We need to enjoy that balanced diet. So as well as all those things, and I certainly don't want to uh, uh, advocate any kind of being a hermit or saying we can't do those things. We need to engage with the world. But nonetheless, alongside those things, the most important part of our diet must be meditating on God's word, listening and singing to Christian songs, reading Christian books, subscribing to Christian social media feeds that are teaching us well from the Bible, maybe listening to Christian radio and spending time with other Christians. We're not to be, Jesus said, he doesn't take us out of the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Being in the world means that we need to engage with the world. So it's okay to, to watch those things as part of a balanced diet and there can be good in them. But nonetheless, if that is the main part of our diet, we will basically be eating McDonald's all day long. And we won't be surprised if we're unfit for that spiritual battle. So let's have a balanced diet. Let's feed on God's word regularly in, in all its forms. Thirdly, Nehemiah, we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. So he does two things here. First of all, he prays. And we need to do this. Prayer is key if we want to keep the kingdom of God, if we want to establish the kingdom of God in our hearts and our minds. We need to regularly ask God to reassert his control over our mind. Pray to help me to have this mind of Christ. Give me the mind of Christ, Lord. I need the mind of Christ. And then set a guard. It's that verse we talked about before. Take every thought captive. Think. If there's one other thing I could get you to go away from, it's to think about what we're consuming. So when you're watching TV, think to yourself, what is this saying? What is it trying to teach me? How is it trying to change my mind? What's good about it? What's bad about it? Don't just be a couch potato that just soaks it all in and just allows it to just, just fill your mind with a whole load of good and rubbish all sort of mixed together. Filter it out, think about it, and then keep the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. Keep your eyes open for those high-minded things that are raised up against the knowledge of God. Nehemiah, build together and battle together. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and they held a weapon in the other hand. They're building together this wall uh, and they're trying to, build, uh, this, this, uh, trying to build a city, but they need to defend themselves against attack. In Deuteronomy it says, These commands that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk about on the, along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You see, these are things that we do together as Christians. One of the most dangerous things we can do is never talk about our faith, never talk about the struggles, the areas in our culture which are conflicting, to think that they're taboo areas. But we need to talk about these things as Christians because we might need somebody's help to understand something. We might need somebody to defend us when we're finding it really under attack and we're like, well, this seems right. What I just watched, surely it's all just about love and that's the most important thing. Doesn't, isn't God love? So surely God is happy when two people, any two people come together in love. How do we answer that? We might need to talk that through with somebody else. Ask ourselves, what does the world think? What does the Bible say? Where do they disagree? How can I understand that? This is a discipline. In Hebrews 5.14, it says that, those, that the mature are those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. If we want to understand, this is another reason, incidentally, why I'd say please do watch um, what's going on in the world. Don't just cut yourself off because we need to exercise our sense of good and evil. And you can't exercise it if you don't actually use it. By reason of use, we need to exercise to discern what is good and what is, right, uh, what is evil. And we need to do that together. Build together and battle together. And finally, plunder the world. 
one of the interesting things about Nehemiah is that not everybody who's not one of God's people is Nehemiah's enemy. And actually, right at the beginning of the book, a Nehemiah goes to the king and he asks the king to give him to send him to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. That's Nehemiah chapter 2. And then he says, will you give me some materials? Will you give me this? And the Bible says that God gave favor to Nehemiah in the eyes of the king. Not everything that you read or that you see in the world is wrong. In fact, even in that short clip that we showed, it is true that nothing makes God happier than when two people come together in love. The issue is, what exactly, what does that love mean? Do they just mean affection and kindness to one another, or is it talking about something sexual, which is where God has the problem? So you see, there's, there's a truth there. There's a truth in, even in that show, which is trying to change our minds. There's a truth there, and that's why it feels right. But it's a truth that has been twisted. Now, what it says in 1 Thessalonians is that we have to test all things and hold fast to what is true. So when we go out into the world, we don't need to have the attitude that says there's nothing good here. I've got to oppose everything because actually there will be some things that we'll know are right and good. But we need to be able to take those things which are good, plunder those things even from the world and say, thank you. You've taught us a little bit about love there, but let me show you the better way. Let me show you this untwisted in the original way that God planned it to be. Test all things and hold fast to what is true. So that's how we fight spiritual warfare. We're to study our terrain, enjoy a balanced diet, pray, set a guard, build together, battle together, and plunder the world. Finally, what hidden dangers might we face as we do that? I said, this is a battle. Those are the things that we can do to attack, but we have an enemy who's going to come back and try and get us. And he's going to be, he's not just going to come right up in front of us and go, you know, this is guerrilla warfare. This is a, a skilled enemy who knows how to get behind our defenses and he's not going to fight fair. Okay? We think the devil does not fight fair. <laughs> uh, we are to fight fair, but the devil doesn't. So we shouldn't be surprised if his tactics are hard to spot and we need to be on the, watch out, on the lookout for them. So what hidden dangers do we face? Well, going back to our three enemies in reverse order. First of all, we'll face, and these are just some of the dangers, the devil. And what does the devil do? Well, the devil says, did God really say... Remember back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1? The devil, the very first question that he asks, he says, did God really say that? And he upcasts doubt on whether what God's word actually says or means. Now, in order to answer that, we need to understand God's word well. This is why it's important to have that diet of the Bible, to understand what God has to say. The way that we counteract the devil, as Jesus taught us when he was tempted, is to answer him with the word of God. And if we don't know God's word, we can't answer back to the devil. This is 2 Timothy. Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing the word of truth. We can study the Bible. Now, don't get me wrong, studying the Bible, knowing the Bible in and of itself is not going to do the job, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But nonetheless, if we don't understand and study the Bible individually, but also together at church and in house groups, we'll have no hope of being able to answer the devil. So we need to know the Bible, know what it does say, know what it doesn't say. If somebody says to you, the Bible says this, go and find out if it actually does or not before you take the word for it, because actually they might, it might not say that are true, or they might have misapplied it in some way. It might be out of context. Secondly, our second enemy and the, the, the tactic that, that it might use, the flesh, what's within us, the, our desires, our desires to be liked, our desires to be well thought of and things like that. The flesh um, may struggle, first of all, to even understand what God's word says. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible and it's just like you just can't quite get what it's on about and you need somebody to help you. Well, that's sometimes the flesh. It's getting in our way. We maybe don't not really ready to hear it. And so um, we sort of, uh, we, we can't understand it. And that's okay. We just need to study better and, and have understanding from others. But what it can also encourage us to do, the flesh, is to twist uh, the scriptures. And this is much more common. So maybe we do understand what the Bible says, but we're tempted to just take God's word and just alter it. Just slightly, just a little bit to make it more comfortable for us, to make it more acceptable to our culture, to make it more what, we, what everyone else says is right, or what everyone else wants to hear. And we need to be aware of that, that there is a risk when we listen to our flesh that we will want to make the Bible less than what it is. We'll want to make it accommodating to us. We'll want it to excuse the sins that we want to keep in our lives. Oh, that's when it talks about that sin, that's not really that serious. We're tempted to twist the scriptures. 
And what's the answer to that? Well, it's the Spirit who opens up and allows us to receive God's word. It's very important to remember that the flesh inside us, it's, we're not neutral. We sometimes think, oh, I'll read the Bible and then I'll do it. But actually, there's a fight that's going to go on between you reading the Bible and you doing it. And it's going to be to do with overcoming the flesh. So don't assume that you've understood the Bible the first time you read it. Really look at it and say, Holy Spirit, open up to God, to God this word to me and help me to receive it. And if I don't like it, if I read the Bible and I find something, I go, but that just doesn't seem right. I don't like it. It doesn't feel right. Then may, the problem might be that you've misunderstood it. It could also be that it's just your flesh inside you going, resisting that and telling you that what's right's wrong and what's wrong's right. This is what the, uh, Romans 7 says about the Bible. The law, God's word, is holy. Each commandment is holy and just and good. No matter how we feel about it, even the ones that we really find, is it really that wrong for people, two, two people that love each other to get married? Is that really wrong? It's holy and just and good. God is good. He wants the best for us. He has the best for us in his word and in his laws. What's the problem? When we struggle with that, when it seems wrong to us, Paul says it's sin, working death in me through the law, so that the extreme malignity and immeasurable sinfulness of sin might plainly appear. That's Romans 7, 12, and 13. One of the effects, if we just read the Bible without the Spirit working in our hearts, we will actually reject it. It is natural. The natural thing is that we'll reject it. And only the Holy Spirit can give us the honesty, can keep us honest, and set us free from that desire to reject God's word and actually to bring it into our hearts and to see how good it is. If you struggle with something the Bible teaches, if you struggle with something that's clearly there, but you think, well, surely that's not right, then pray about it. Lord, change my heart. Help me to understand. Study it more. Understand why God does these things. Ask God to show you why he says these things. Why maybe the harsher things are for our good. And ask him to set us free from that flesh, which wants to be the vampire and keep us away from the light. In Romans 8, 1, it says, The law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So let's resist that temptation which is inside us all to twist the scriptures to make them comfortable and instead uh, ask the spirit to open our eyes. Finally, the world. Even if we resist the devil's lies and we, we, we know God's word and we understand and receive the word by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we accept its truth without resisting that, the world around about us is still going to attack us. They are going to speak against us as those who do what is evil. That's 1 Peter 2 verse 12. And this is going to happen on many issues today. There are many issues in which Christianity is increasingly at odds with what the world says. And they don't just think that we're odd anymore. It used to be that they thought that Christians were just a bit odd for not wanting to have sex before marriage and things like that. But, you know, it's just a bit one of those little peculiar things we can live with that. Hopefully you've noticed that in our culture recently, some things that we might believe are no longer just odd, but they're actually evil. They've taken things which God says are good, and they've said those are evil, and they've said, taken things which God says are evil, and they've said those things are good. Have you noticed that in our culture? This is not something that should surprise us. Something that happened to the early Christians. They were accused of being cannibals because they ate of the body of the Lord in the, in the Lord's Supper. It wasn't true, they weren't cannibals, but that was the accusation that was thrown against them. Nowadays, we might be called a horrible person or a bigot because we believe what the Bible says about certain issues. How do we respond to the world when we feel under attack and that we're called names, we're spoken against as evil? Well, the Bible says the victory that has overcome the world is our faith. What is faith? Faith is believing that God is good and that God's word is good. That even if the world says something is it's good and, and God says it's bad, that God's the one who's right, even if we can't always understand why. That God's word is good and what God says is the best for us. And what God says is good is good and what God says is bad is bad. And we need to stand up for that. We need to hold on to that faith and say, yes, Lord, I trust you that these things are right. The verse in 1 Peter goes on saying, even those who speak against you as those who do what is evil will, by observing your good works, Glorify God on the day of visitation. So even if somebody says you're a horrible person, prove them wrong. Show kindness, even to people that are living in complete rebellion against God. Make friends with somebody who's got an alternative lifestyle that you can't approve of, but nonetheless, you can love them and show them kindness. 
you can show them that it's not about the person. You don't hate the person. It's the sin which you believe is destroying them because they're living outside of God's pattern. Show kindness, show love, show uh, um, compassion to others, uh, be charitable. All of those things, the commands God gives us, live in that way. And people will have to face up to that complete, you know, you're such a horrible person for what you believe, I think, but the way you live is wonderful. And they'll have to resolve that somewhere or another. <laughs> make, make it hard work for them. That they can't work out how a person that believes that can be so kind. And actually the Bible says that that often will convict people. This is 2 Timothy 4.25. The Lord's slave must not quarrel. We're not to get into arguments with people. And you know, I'm not saying we can't disagree with somebody. But we're not to get, be argumentative. But must be gentle to everyone. Instructing his opponents with gentleness. They may come to their senses and escape the devil's trap having been captured by them to do his will. You notice we're not just to leave people alone. We're not just to say, oh, you just get on with your life and I'll get on with mine. These are people that disagree with us. We need to instruct them. We need to try and help them to see that. Why? Because we love them. Because they're trapped. They've been captured by the devil to do his will. And if we love those people, we'll want to get them out of that trap and bring them in, into God's kingdom. That's what Christianity evangelism is all about, isn't it? but not in a quarrelsome way, not in a way that makes people hate us because of the way that we are. They might hate what we say, but the way that we act should always be glorifying to God. So how do we overcome the world? Well, we have faith. We stand on the truth of God's word. Let God be true and every man a liar, Paul says. He will reward and he will use our witness and he, in the end, will vindicate us. He will show that what we believe is true and he will help us to establish that kingdom in our lives. And not just in our lives, but also in the lives of others. And that's hopefully what we'll start to look at next time we study this together. Is we'll think about God's kingdom in our family. How we can establish that and, and encourage our families. Think about schools, workplaces. Think about the world as well. So that's the next few things. Quick summary of what we've been looking at. Establishing God's kingdom in our minds. Um, I thought it was quite an interesting picture. It's Satan and Christ battling it together over our minds. Uh, we're involved as well. We have a part to play. We are in a battle for our minds. Don't think you can be neutral. Don't think you can appease your enemy. Don't think that any option other than fighting back is going to succeed. We are in a battle. We need to engage. We have three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world around about us, the flesh within us. Uh, and the devil high above us. Don't forget any of those enemies. Don't, think, don't fall into what the world says, which is you're a good person. Um, in Christ, you are perfectly righteous. In yourself, there's nothing, Paul says, nothing good dwells inside us of ourselves. We have the flesh. Don't ever deny that. Realize that even within yourself, there is an enemy which needs to be opposed, as well as those other two. But here is the promise. We have the mind of Christ. The word, the spirit, our faith, and I'm adding to that one another. We also have one another. We have many allies who are in us in this battle. We can have the victory, and most important, the power of Christ. Be serious. Think and take every thought captive. Don't just drift through life allowing the world to tell you what to think. Let Jesus tell you what to think. Allow his word to be the thing, the primary thing that controls the way that you think and act. Um, and God has a great reward and there's a great blessing. It's hard work, but it's a great blessing in knowing the kingdom of God because we are on the victory side. The kingdom of God will destroy all kingdoms, all other worlds. And there's a great comfort and peace as well that comes from knowing uh, the love of God and, and establishing his kingdom in our hearts. I hope that's a blessing to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Now we'll, um, we're still on live stream, yes? Yeah. So we'll have the song for this purpose. If I get Graham Kendrick, lovely song. <coughs> oh, I just want to add to that, <coughs> I'm so glad God has had the victory. Because I don't think I could deal with the devil without him. So as we sing this song, let's just reflect on what he's done for us. Amen. Amen.
Now we'll uh, we'll pronounce the blessing as we go off live stream. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.